Close your eyes and imagine. No, don't imagine. Listen. Listen to the voices of the past, the ones they don't tell you about in history books. Here, in the cradle of civilization, gods don't just sit in the sky. They walk the streets, whisper in your ear, and shape your destiny. Kings aren't just rulers, they are chosen, challenged, and sometimes destroyed by the very myths that define them. This is Mesopotamia, where history isn't just told, it's felt, where every fact has a myth lurking in a shadow, and every myth holds a sliver of truth. Chapter 1, Enki's Secret Diary I am Enki, the god of wisdom, water, and creation. My people call me the trickster and the keeper of secrets, but today, I open my diary to you. You see, even gods have secrets. I resided in Eridu, the first city on earth, a place of wonder and beginnings. It was a city by the water, at the edges of the great rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. My people believed I shaped these rivers and taught them the ways of farming, writing, and building great cities. But it wasn't always this way. One day, as I watched from my temple in Eridu, I saw the humans struggling. They were trying to build their homes, plant their fields, but they did not know how. They were lost, like children in the dark. My heart felt heavy. Should I intervene? My father, Anu, the sky god, had forbidden us from giving too much knowledge to humans. Humans must learn on their own, he decreed. Yet, I could not bear to watch them suffer. So, in the quiet of the night, I decided to help. I sent streams of water to their fields, whispering the secrets of irrigation in their dreams. I guided their hands as they sowed seeds in the fertile earth. And that is how the rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates became the lifelines of Sumer, nourishing the land and the people. From these rivers flowed knowledge of planting crops, of crafting tools, and of building homes. The people began to flourish, and their cities grew tall and proud. But every action has consequences. The other gods noticed what I had done. My brother in Lil, the god of air and storms, was furious. You meddle too much, Enki, he roared. You risk the order we have created. But I stood my ground. Knowledge is not a curse, brother. I said calmly. It is a gift. This was the beginning of our disagreements. You see, it wasn't just the humans who were learning. We gods were learning too. We were learning about the balance between power and compassion, between order and chaos. My actions were not just about saving the humans. They were about testing the boundaries of what it means to be a god. I had defied the edicts of the heavens to bring life and learning to earth. And I would not be the last god to do so. Enlil, however, was not satisfied with just words. He was worried that my interference would make humans too powerful, too knowledgeable, and too independent. He feared a world where humans could challenge the gods themselves. Our debates would continue for centuries, shaping the destiny of both gods and men. In those days, we gods walked among humans. We watched their joys and their sorrows. We guided them with unseen hands and whispered wisdom into their hearts. But we also watched them make their own choices, for better or worse. We understood that the real power lies not in controlling humans, but in giving them the freedom to find their path. And so, I kept my diary. Not just as a record of my deeds, but as a reminder of my purpose. To guide, to teach, and to learn. Thus began the story of humanity's rise. A tale of divine intervention and mortal ambition, of secrets shared and knowledge uncovered. And as you turn these pages, know that the story is far from over. Chapter 2 A Scribe's Tale The Great Flood.
My name is Nabu, a humble scribe from the great city of Shurapak, where the Euphrates River flows with stories older than time itself. I am a keeper of knowledge, a recorder of events, and today, I share a tale passed down to me by my grandfather, a tale of a great flood that changed the world. He told me it began with the skies growing dark and ominous, a heavy silence as if the world held its breath. Then it rained, not just for days, but for weeks. The rivers swelled like angry beasts, and the waters rose higher and higher, flooding fields, swallowing homes, and carrying away everything in their path. People were terrified. They said the gods were angry. In Lil, the mighty god of storms and wind, had grown tired of the noise and wickedness of mankind. He wanted to wash away the evil, to cleanse the earth with a great flood. But all was not lost. My grandfather said that Enki, the wise god of water and creation, felt compassion for humanity. Enki, who had always been closer to the humans than any other god, decided to defy the will of his brother, Enlil. In secret, Enki whispered to a righteous man named Zayusidra, Build a boat, he urged. Make it large and strong. Save your family. Save the creatures of the earth. Zayusidra was a pious man, one who had always revered the gods and kept their commandments. He listened to Enki's warning and gathered his family, friends, and animals, working day and night to construct a boat from cedar wood and bitumen. It was a vessel of survival, a floating refuge. With Enki's guidance, he filled the boat with seeds and supplies, and when the rain began to fall, he sealed it shut just as the waters began to rise. For days and nights, the boat floated on the endless waters, with nothing but the sound of rain and waves crashing against its wooden sides. Zayusidra prayed to the gods for mercy, offering songs and tears to the heavens. Days turned into weeks, and still, the rain did not cease. The people inside the boat were weary, afraid, and uncertain if they would ever see dry land again. Finally, the rain stopped. The clouds parted, and the sun began to shine. The waters, slowly at first, began to recede. The boat came to rest on the top of a mountain, believed to be Mount Nizur. When Zayusidra stepped out, he offered sacrifices to the gods, burning sweet-smelling herbs and making prayers of gratitude. The gods, smelling the sweet offerings, were moved. Even in Lil, who had been furious, softened. We will not destroy mankind again, they promised. Instead, they set a covenant with Zayusidra, vowing that they would never again bring such a flood upon the earth. In return, they asked that humans learn from this event, to live in harmony with each other and respect the gods. Yet as a scribe, I often wonder, was this just a story, a myth told by the elders to teach us lessons, or did it really happen? I have seen the marks of floods etched onto the walls of our city, signs of water damage on ancient stones. I have heard stories of the great river, the Euphrates, washing away entire villages. Perhaps, just perhaps, there is truth in the myth. Maybe the gods were not just angry. Maybe they were teaching us through these stories, showing us the balance between life and death, between justice and mercy. And so I write this down, not just as a tale of divine wrath, but as a testament to our survival, our endurance, and our hope. Whether the flood was sent by gods or merely a twist of fate, it reminds us that we are fragile, like leaves in the wind, but also resilient, like the roots that grip the earth. The story of the Great Flood is central to many ancient Mesopotamian texts. 
including the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Sumerian creation myths. It shares remarkable similarities with other flood myths, such as the biblical story of Noah's Ark, suggesting a common source or shared cultural memory of a devastating flood event. Archaeological evidence has found flood layers in various Mesopotamian cities, supporting the idea that such floods occurred and were significant enough to inspire these enduring myths. Chapter 3, The Warrior Queen, A Mythical Reality I am Kugbao, once a humble tavern keeper in the city of Kish. Yes, you heard right. I, who served drinks to weary travelers and merchants, now stand as a queen. The gods have strange ways of shaping our destinies. I was an innkeeper, a mere woman of common birth. My tavern sat at the crossroads of dusty trade routes, where men from distant lands would gather, sharing tales of battles, fortunes, and lost loves. I listened to their stories, learned their ways, and kept my ears open. But I never imagined that I, Cub Bao, would one day become the ruler of this great city. One day, a mighty warrior stopped at my tavern. He spoke with a voice like thunder and told of a prophecy, that a woman would rise to power and unite the city-states of Sumer. I laughed at him, a laugh filled with disbelief and curiosity. I am just a tavern keeper, I said, pouring him a drink. How could I, a woman of no noble birth, rise to such power? But deep in my heart, I felt a fire, a spark that was waiting to ignite. His words lingered in my mind, haunting my thoughts like a whisper from the gods themselves. The warrior left, but his prophecy stayed with me. Then came the war, a fierce conflict that threatened to tear the city of Kish apart. Chaos reigned and the people were desperate for a leader, someone who could guide them through the storm. The city's men of power, priests, warriors, and merchants were paralyzed with fear, arguing among themselves, too caught up in their own interests to see the suffering of the people. The city needed someone with courage, with vision, and in that moment, I felt the calling. I stepped forward, let me lead, I declared. Some called it madness. Others laughed, but the people saw something in me. They saw strength, determination, and an unyielding spirit. They whispered that the gods had chosen me, that I was the woman of the prophecy. I gathered the people, rallied the warriors, and we fought with everything we had. We defended our city from its enemies, not with just weapons, but with a fierce resolve to protect what was ours. My enemies underestimated me, thinking I was just a woman, just an innkeeper. But I showed them that a woman could fight with the ferocity of a lioness. I led my people to victory, and they crowned me queen. I, Cut Bao, became the first and only woman to rule over the Sumerian king. They say I had the strength of a lioness and the wisdom of a goddess. Under my rule, Kish flourished. I brought peace to my people, reformed the laws to be fairer, and ensured that prosperity reached even the humblest of homes. But was it all just a myth? Or was it the reality of a woman who refused to be bound by her birth, who dared to challenge the norms of her time? I like to think it was both a myth that inspired reality and a reality that became a myth. You see, in those days, stories were like rivers. They flowed from person to person, village to village, until they became legends. Even now, I hear whispers. Some say I was blessed by the gods, while others say I was just a woman with ambition and courage. But does it matter? I united the city-states brought peace to the warring factions, and proved that power is not defined by gender or birth, but by strength of will and the courage to act. Go.
Chug Bao, also known as Kebaba, is a fascinating figure in Mesopotamian history. She is listed in the Sumerian king list as the only woman to have ever reigned as a monarch. According to the king list, Chug Bao reigned for 100 years, a sign of divine favor or the way her reign was mythologized over time. Although the details of her life remain shrouded in mystery, her rise from a tavern keeper to a queen suggests she was a figure of remarkable character and ability. This blend of historical fact and myth captures how her story became larger than life, inspiring generations to come. Chapter 4, Gilgamesh Speaks, A Hero's Quest I am Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, two-thirds god, one-third man. Born of a mortal father and Ninsen, a goddess, I was blessed with strength and wisdom beyond ordinary men. My name was known across Sumer, my deeds spoken of in every corner of the land. I build great walls around Uruk, walls that seem to reach the heavens, walls meant to protect my people and to show the world the power of a king. But despite all I had, my heart was restless. I felt a void, an insatiable hunger for more for something that no king could easily grasp. I was determined to conquer death itself, to become more than just a name on a list of kings. But my journey began with a friend, my equal Enkidu, a wild man created by the gods to be my match, to temper my pride, and to stand by my side. We were like two halves of the same soul, and together we ventured into the unknown, to the ends of the earth where no mortal had dared tread. We sought adventure, faced monstrous beasts sent by the gods themselves. We battled Humbaba, the terrifying guardian of the cedar forest, and the bull of heaven sent by the goddess Ishtar in her wrath. Each time, we emerged victorious, our bond growing stronger with every challenge. But our victories came at a cost. The gods, angered by our defiance, decreed that Enkidu must die. I watched as my friend, my brother, succumbed to a slow and agonizing death. His passing left me shattered, filled with grief and fear. I realized then that even the mightiest are not spared from death. It was this loss that drove me to seek the secret of eternal life, to journey further still, to the ends of the earth, beyond the mountains of Mashu, across the waters of death. I sought Adnapishtim, the one man who had survived the great flood and been granted immortality by the gods. Through trials and tribulations, I reached him, only to be told that eternal life is not for mortals. The gods kept it for themselves, he said. They gave you life, live it to the fullest. I was crushed. I had come so far, faced so much, only to learn that immortality was a mirage, an illusion. The gods told me, live your life, Gilgamesh, for that is all we have. In that moment, I understood. I understood that it was not the quest for eternal life that mattered, but the quest to live life meaningfully. I returned to Uruk, my heart heavier, but my spirit wiser. I had faced the gods, monsters, and my deepest fears. And through it all, I found a different kind of immortality. I chose to build gardens instead of just walls, to create stories, to share my experiences. I became a king who listened to his people, who cared for them, who built not just monuments of stone, but monuments of memory and love. So, when you hear my story, remember it is not just mine. It is the story of every person who has ever sought meaning in their life who has faced the unknown with courage, 
who has struggled with the inevitability of death. It is your story too. And so, dear listener, we have journeyed through time, through the intertwining paths of myths and history, through the eyes of gods, scribes, queens, and kings. If you enjoyed this exploration into the stories of old, consider subscribing to our channel for more engaging content like this. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know in the comments what history blend with myths, heroes, or historical figures you'd like us to dive into next.